Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. I want you to look at the images on Coast to Coast AM that Glenn sent to us that Lexus posted right under Glenn Steckling's name. He's the director, copyright owner of the 60-year-old-plus George Adamski Foundation, one of the oldest enduring UFO organizations. Degreed veteran, 35-year airline pilot, retired with more than 23,000 hours of flight time across the globe, also an amateur astronomer, author, lecturer, and he shares his own unique UFO experiences and history exceeding over half a century. Here he is back on Coast to Coast with the UFO reality. Glenn, always a pleasure having you on the show. Well, thank you, George. A good morning to you, and it's a pleasure to interact with you. Explain to our incredible audience who George Adamski was. Well, he was considered one of the uh, pioneers of the early contactee movement. He had taken a number of UFO photos already starting in the uh, late 30s, early 40s uh, that he gave to the U.S. government and military. Uh, and they became uh, more prevalent after the Second World War when he got himself uh, some um, new telescopic equipment and he mounted the camera on it and moved to the base of Mount Palomar, which is the home of the 200-inch Hale Observatory. And he started taking a number of photographs clear of these uh, bell-shaped and cigar-shaped UFOs. Uh, they mimed the same photographs that I uh, submitted to your producer that's also on my uh, photo page there from 1949, October, in which the astronomical staff took over a period of one week a number of UFO photos uh, both uh, information and singularly. And this was all uh, submitted to Project Blue Book along with George's reports and photographs and what have you. So his experiences spanned for a number, about 20 years. And uh, he was uh, known for his books, Flying Saucers Have Landed, which he co-authored with Sir Desmond Leslie of uh, the Leslie uh, lineage in Ireland, the Royal Lineage in Ireland, and uh, and then later Inside the Spaceships, and then his third book, uh, Flying Saucer's Farewell, which we re-released as its uh, paperback title was done in the 1970s. We re-released it in 2015 with editions and photographs and called it Behind the Flying Saucer Mystery 2. So George was well known around the world. He took uh, two world tours lectured, showed his films, unparalleled films, taken in many different locations. And um, he uh, interacted with a number of heads of state, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, uh, and others, Queen Juliana, uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third. So uh, you can really say that from the standpoint of UFO history, uh, nobody stands out uh, like George Adamski. What did people think of him at the time, Glenn? I think that he was very well received. We were in an era, of course, of, of space exploration. Uh, when we, the scientists uh, from Penamunda, from Germany, were taken to White Sands and uh, sequestered there for the rocket systems. And, um, and uh, the people were, were thinking about space. And, of course, then in, in 58, uh, when Sputnik went up, and then shortly thereafter, President Eisenhower created uh, NASA. And then people's minds were in space, and they were also, more importantly, uh, given enough factual, credible evidence. I mean, uh, as I said in, in the second half of my book, uh, one chapter talks about mass sightings, because people always say, well, you know, how come they don't land on the White House yard, or, or they're not seen more, or uh, or as lately the Israeli uh, 
uh, a spokesman who said, well, that they're, they're hiding from us because they don't want us to panic. Uh, that's absolute nonsense. If you look at, uh, look at, let's just start in our own country of July 52. All the flying saucers taken, photographed in formation, flying through uh, Washington's airspace behind the Capitol building. We scrambled F-86s and uh, P-80 shooting stars in order to chase them down, and we got absolutely nowhere. Then you had mass sightings over uh, the United Kingdom in 1954, then Central Europe through France and Paris, and then November of 54, for one week, they were there every day performing aerial uh, maneuvers over Rome and the Vatican. And if you look, uh, I included it in the book as well, the pictures from Japan and from Russia. Great book, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. It, it took a number of years, and during my illness, I put it aside for two years and then finally kicked myself and said, let's get it finished and get it done because it needs to be out there. So I think that um, it's important that people are, you know, especially the newer generations that are so addicted to the Internet, everything is, is momentary flash. They have no concept of the history and the actual circumstances behind this UFO field. And since my family had met and worked Alongside George and Amsky became his personal friends and co-workers. We became exposed to these spaceships close and their and their pilots, their their space uh, visitors, and uh, and from there, as I said in the book, uh, we went to NASA and uh, to the Pentagon and the House of Lords and and all these institutions that treated this subject courteously and knowledgeably they knew a lot of information about it already and like colonel freeman said when they looked at george's pictures and dad's films they said these are some of the best they've seen in civilian hands yeah you got involved in this because of your father didn't you well yeah the whole family you know my entire family my father and mother and i we witnessed a ufo over downtown dc not the first one but this was in march of 63 there were 30 other witnesses and the reporter for the Washington Daily News, and it was in the newspaper the following day. And one of these bell-shaped scouts were hanging about uh, and maneuvering about 1,200 feet above central Washington, D.C., and then my father said, well, we've seen plenty of these things, and he had witnessed them as a kid, both my father and mother, during the war in Europe. So he went to the Library of Congress and started with A for Adamski, and there were the books, there were the photographs of the same things we had seen. And uh, my father wrote him, and George said, I'm coming to D.C. Uh, in a couple months to lecture to the Air Force Reserves. We'll meet then. And so from then, that's how the story, you know, uh, gathered uh, speed and accumulated. And uh, we were eventually the inheritors of all the Adamski estate materials and copyrights, and uh, we continued the foundation. My father passed away in 91. And I became uh, primary director, and my mother passed away in 2018, so all the legal uh, paperwork and copyrights and everything like that went from her to me. So I continue the work, and um, I find it very fulfilling, and um, I was very happy to put that book out. I think it gives people a realistic, rational view of the history that we experienced in this UFO field. And um, my God, when I think about all the things that they did, my parents and myself, I mean, you, you really don't think about it accumulatively until you go back and start writing it down. And, um, and then you remember things you didn't include and what have you. But I think there's sufficient information in that book. And I think the second chapter, the reality check, uh, deals with the terrible dysfunction within the UFO community that is has evolved today. It's crazy these days. You should give your book to every member of Congress whenever they do these hearings, you know? Well, we'll see what happens. I mean, I've done a number of shows. I did one in Scotland last week. I'll do one in the United Kingdom on Sunday. And I'm trying to work to get the book out in some multiple languages, depending on how the publishers are, are agreeable to it. And... Um, like I said, it, um, considering what's out there, you know, I, I, I really 
don't uh, find the material that I release to the public any more astonishing than any of the other stuff that's being said. Glenn, where did you get the pictures you sent to us that we have posted on the website? Yes, the pictures uh, on the website. Let me see here. Here, The first one, or, or rather the second one after the link to the UFO films on YouTube, the one that has the white mothership and the two scouts. This is a film my father took in 1966. He took two films, two very famous films, one of a fleet of uh, UFOs traveling in the train from uh, Schifferstadt to Mannheim, and uh, that was shown on German national television. And this second film he took out of the porthole of, of the 707 as we were coming back from Europe. Uh, and you could see the mothership and the two scouts there. And then as the film continues to run, uh, the image slowly moves and then moves underneath the number two engine, the number two nacelle, as we pass it by. So that came as a film frame from that film. Uh, the secondary picture of the scout that's a bit blurred, this was taken by George Adamski in 1952 at the uh, famous contact site in Desert Center. And uh, there's also, I recently put a uh, YouTube uh, composition on my uh, YouTube channel that has only Desert Center, how to get there, how it looks now, all of that. So it's, it's a pretty good preview, uh, especially for people who are going to go to the uh, the UFO conference there in Joshua Tree, uh, it's not too far away. The third picture is a lenticular uh, ship. Uh, the older ship is bell-shaped, like the previous photograph. And the newer ships now are lenticular-shaped. The bell-shaped craft before it is only good within the atmospheric realm of the uh, planet, so about 200 miles and lower. And it requires a cigar-shaped craft, very much like an aircraft carrier, to bring it to the planet. And then it uses the spell shaped craft to go about its uh, exercises uh, within the planet's atmosphere. But this lenticular ship, this new ship, it carries a crew of about three to five. And it can go from planet to planet and, and travel deep space without the necessity of the mothership. Have they and learned I how to bend space and time, Glenn? Well, they don't have to. Uh, you know, bending space and time is nothing more than a theory. Right. And as I read uh, recently, the famous quotation that our scientists are now pushing upon the people, they say that, uh, uh, what do they say? They said, uh, theory becomes fact until we can prove it otherwise. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, it's science is supposed to be exactly the opposite. Yeah, so you're basically told to accept whatever they throw at you. And uh, if you haven't forgotten about it over time and they decide to come back to that issue, you know, you may get some further information. So, no, what they do is they travel at exceedingly high speeds because they replicate the conditions of the planet itself. You think about Earth, we travel through space at 1,000 miles an hour, rotate at 17,000. Then the planet travels around the sun, the sun travels around its universe core. So to make a long story short, this entire system that we are living in is moving at about 1.3 million miles an hour. And yet we sit here perfectly comfortable without the slightest clue. And they have duplicated nature's principles because they work totally within the natural spectrum. There is no such thing as anti-gravity or anti-matter. They work pro-gravity. In fact, their system is called pro-gravitic. They work along with nature because nature produces so much power. The planet trillions upon trillions of uh, volts like a Van de Graaff generator. And so in order to go anti, you would have to produce enough power to nullify that to zero and then produce again that entire spectrum of power to create new. Well, that's double work. They think it's much easier just to work with nature and they can travel at twice the speed of light. And I've heard that their newer systems are even capable of doing faster than that. So the nearest uh, star system is four light years. So, you know, they may be able to do that in a week or two. So there's no need. We, we have become so enamorized with science fiction terms, 
uh, uh, parallel universes, other dimensions, time warp, uh, all these other things. This is, these are all figments of our growing and prosperous scientific sci uh, fi industry. But it doesn't have to do anything with actual potential. Why do you believe UFO history is being corrupted? Well, because I think that if we look at it, we see that there is a, a very uh, concentrated effort to take current dogma and current uh, thinking and try to push it back in history as far as possible so that people are willing to accept it. So, for instance, when they, people are talking now about Ezekiel, they say, well, Ezekiel, as it's written in the Bible, this was taken on a ship for a ride. Well, the pro-abduction crowd loves to use that word taken. Right. Because that's supposed to indicate you went somewhere against your will. However, in, in Ezekiel, they never said that he was taken against his will. And it's, it's not any different than saying my neighbor took me to 7-Eleven to pick up a, you know, a six-pack of uh, Diet Pepsi. He didn't have to kidnap me to do it. And so the, the use of semantics is being manipulated, just like the term UAP. Why? UFO is well known, and it's become associated with extraterrestrial spacecraft. But if they can get the new generation to bite on this transition to UAP, then an entire new focus, an entire new definition can be rerouted and reconstructed in order to leave that past behind. And it's the definition they want, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and so we see that that this reconstruction of, of history, I mean, people talk about Roswell and they talk about Kenneth Arnold. Well, Kenneth Arnold was not the litmus test for the term flying saucer. If you look it up, in 1878 in Denison, Texas, there was a witness sighting in which they called it a flying saucer. That term was used long before Kenneth Arnold's time. And everybody makes a big deal out of Roswell, well, as well they should. But who talks about uh, the incident there, um, Cape Girardeau, in the Midwest of the United States in 1941? Right. And, of course, there are other... Uh, sites like that in Mexico and in and, and Russia and all kinds of other places around the world. And so there's a, there's a very orchestrated funneling of information that they want you to have, and they can easily then diverge it by injecting other information that doesn't work, like the MJ-12 papers. Part of it has some credibility to it, but latter parts of it are clearly misrepresentation and false. But what a better way than to grab people, especially people in the UFO community who don't know any better. They like to say they do, but they haven't a clue. And so they start to support something, and then they, people follow them in that support, and then a whole genre of, of people begin to believe something that isn't true or has been corrupted. Glenn Steckling with us. His website, AdamskiFoundation.com, is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. Glenn, do you find that the UFO cases from the past have changed dramatically from what we're hearing today? Yes, I do, and for several reasons. Uh, prior to 1961, uh, there were photographs taken of these crafts uh, going back as far as 1918 over Central Europe and depicted also in medieval paintings and described in biblical records and uh, records from other uh, uh, civilizations mm -hmm. around the globe, to Tibet, to Polynesia, Incas, Mayans, Aztecs, Egyptians, Greeks, uh, nearly every civilization that you can uh, link up with history has some kind of uh, description of benevolent beings that have come amongst their society and brought uh, wellness, uh, peaceful thinking, 
um, uh, increase in uh, the productivity of agriculture and science and medicine, and then they left and went back to where they came from. And so this history uh, likes to be ignored by the UFO community because that that uh, is very much different from what went divergent in 61. In 61, since there was no ability for our governments to control the landing of these crafts among the people. So basically what happened it is in 54, George Adamski took uh, Eisenhower out to an air base here in California. The craft landed, Eisenhower went on board, and there was a discussion. The discussion, the real one, not this uh, bozo one that's out there circulating, that they wanted to exchange for uh, de human DNA and right. human bodies and all this other stuff, we, nonsense. Oh, they were going to give the government secrets to take yeah, us, no, right? but... What they were going to do is they offered a limited amount of technology in return for an agreement that we would suspend our nuclear testing program. And the president and the government said no, flat out. And so uh, even if it, when it was explained to them that that was on the verge of destroying our own world and all our people, we still didn't care. Kennedy took this much more seriously when he was taken out there by George. He took... Uh, JFK and his brother, the Attorney General, out to a different base here in California, and they had a discussion and uh, that landed on the tarmac, and the President went on board, and after that, uh, George was given a White House access card, which he showed us and showed a number of people, that gave him access to the White House 24-7. Uh, through the underground entrances, not through the, you know, driving up the front in front of all the people and cameras and publicity. No, there's a number of underground entrances in which the military and everybody else uses to access the White House so whenever they want to go in and out unnoticed. And so George was a, a number of times in there briefing the president. And so what happened is, is that after the assassination of Kennedy, everything went divergent. And we went into a mode of let's scare the heck out of the public. Because before that, when the poll was taken in 59, if one of these craft landed, would you be willing to go there and look and at least interact with the occupants? And the answer was by far majority yes. When we got to the mid-70s, by the time we got through uh, several cases, one in 67, another one in Pensacola, and I think it was 71, we finally started to scare the wits out of the people enough so that they wanted to run the other direction when that poll was taken and so they would get their guns and, and arm themselves and be ready to attack. And I think the science fiction community, which few people know, that the military has an office directly across the street from the studios. If you read the book Hollywood vs. the Flying Saucer or Silver Screen Saucers, two excellent books on the subject, all of the science fiction, uh, um, what do you call that, uh, compositions uh, were had to clear with military approval before they were allowed to go forward and what was allowed to go forward into production for science fiction movies. And God knows what we've come up with since, you know, Mars on the Attack, Alien, Armageddon, Men in Black. I mean, there's no end to the hor horrific uh, depictions of anything that comes from space, which any biochemist will tell you is absolute nonsense. In fact, uh, Dr. Cyril Panampura, who used to, who's passed away, uh, but he used to run the Chemical Evolution Laboratory in Maryland, and he said, you're going to find life throughout the cosmos to be the same as we have here, because all the essentials, the organic chemistry, the amino acids, the RNA and DNA, are surrounding us in space. These organic materials rain down on our planet through our atmosphere to the tune of several tons every day. And so not only do we absorb these materials, that's how, in fact, we when you go to Antarctica and they pull up a meteorite and say, hey, well, look here, this came from Mars, or this or that. It's because we are traveling through the trailing edge of these organic materials that are flowing away from our planet and also the ones that are coming through our atmosphere. And so uh, the narrative, once again, is quite different 
prior to 1961, and that's part of the history that I spoke about, and also the fact that it annoys uh, more current uh, representatives of this field, so they try desperately to go back into that section of history and find something that they can compound towards their belief in order so that people won't question so severely why is it so different. Glenn, we could do a complete show just on George Adamski, you know that? Easy enough. We should do that. I mean, he was born in 1891? Uh, he was born in Poland, and then the, uh, the family immigrated here within two years uh, on the old ocean liner coming to the United States as immigrants going uh, through Ellis Island. And um, so he had quite a uh, descriptive and unique life. And I can only say from having interacted with a man for two years before his passing and so many of the co-workers around the world that knew him well uh, that um, that the, the accumulation of experience uh, that I have been fortunate enough to be subjected to uh, provides an unshakable foundation. Did you like him? Mm -hmm. Did you like him? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He was a he was a very charming fellow, and he often spent time watching me when my and when he was in D.C. because we all were in the same house when he came to visit, and for many weeks we lived there together. And my parents helped arrange um, a newspaper and television and radio shows and whatever. So there was a number of times when. I was with him, and he was uh, very gracious to show me some very astonishing things. His first sighting was 1946? Well, he actually got his first telescope in 1938 from uh, Mrs. Lolita Johnson. And the interesting uh, history to that is uh, that six-inch telescope is also, if you look in the Los Angeles Times, April 30th, I believe, 1938, there's a there's a expose an article about George that shows his picture and his telescopes and it talks about him in '38 and having uh, that uh, device. I mean, in those days, a small telescope was that like that was still quite a uh, uh, an achievement. But the interesting thing is that Lo Mrs. Lolita Johnson, her son Joseph Johnson, became a doctor working for Caltech and he was responsible for the star charting and the uh, geographic uh, location setting for the Hale Observatory. And so it was he who came to Valley Center in 1945 and said, George, it's a good idea if you move closer to the mountain and closer to, uh, to all the activities having to do with the observatory. And uh, because a lot's going on, he said uh, there were so many sightings of ships in that area and so George, once again, he moved from in 45 to the base of Mount Palomar, the property called Palomar Gardens, which is now Oak Knoll. And we recently had in November a type of a small symposium there. I held a symposium there with George's films, everything on location. And, um, and so that's when it really started to pick up with the photographs. There were a number of of ships sighted all over San Diego County that was in the San Diego Union in 46, 47. And so the pictures were starting to being taken, and um, and it accelerated from there. It is dramatic, Glenn. The work you do, too, is incredible. Keep it up. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I certainly plan to. Uh, I am probably the last representative of this uh, of this material and this foundation, so well, I'll do the best I can. Where do people get your book, The UFO Reality? It is available from the publisher, and the publisher is Blurb, B-L-U-R-B dot com. It's a little bit hard to navigate their website, but when you pull up the home page, on the top of the screen you'll see a place called Bookstore. You click on that. That takes you to another page where there's a search engine. You type in my last name, Steckling, and that will take you to the page where the hard copy and the soft copy are available. I also have it available on eBay along with our other books that we talked before, uh, Alien Bases on the Moon 2, and a number of other books uh, that, um, that uh, you know, we have uh, put together throughout the years. Glenn, what do you think the UFO agenda is? Well, think of it this way. 
Disclosure, as you and I already discussed, is basically an illusion. In 1960, you have the organization called NICAP, which was much greater because uh, MUFON didn't come along until 69. So NICAP was run by Major Kehoe, and he wrote a number of excellent books uh, about this subject. And they had over 12,000 reports. Uh, Colonel Freeman was also part of that, who we saw, my father saw at the Pentagon, and is described in the book. And also uh, Admiral Hillencotter, who was the first uh, director of the CIA. And so all this material was given to Congress, to the Speaker of the House, McCormick, I believe his name was, uh, Senator Barry Goldwater, Gerald Ford, a number of people, all of it to bring this information out. And basically, the CIA, who took the UFO uh, subject away from the Air Force, told them all that it was none of their business. They did not deserve to know. And in fact, that was Donald Rumsfeld's exact words, uh, if I have it correctly, that he said to the members of of the legislature that it's none of your business, basically. Glenn, we are out of time, my friend. Good luck with the book, The UFO Reality. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.